Hello, I'm Dr. Sandeep Salvi, the director of the Palmokya Research and Education Foundation situated in the city of Pune. I'm going to be talking about the impact of air pollution on human health and share with you some very exciting work uh, that uh, we have also contributed to in this field and potential solutions as to what could be done to reduce the impact of air pollution on health. That's going to be the next part of my, the last part of my presentation. So it's been a real pleasure to be with uh, all of you all and I hope that uh, you'll get a lot of good learning from this uh, presentation. Out of the three basic necessities of life, uh, we always give a lot of importance to food. And if I ask you what is the quantum of food that one needs to consume on a daily basis to keep ourselves fit and well, uh, the answer would be somewhere around one to two kilograms of food. You could, you could quantify that in terms of calories or simpler still, this is, what, is, what is the amount of weight of food that you consume every day? Uh, so that's, that, that's a basic necessity of life, obviously. Uh, and the second basic necessity of life is uh, water. And on a daily basis, we need to drink about two to, two to three liters of water every day. Now, because we need to spend money to get good food, and clean drinking water, we have value for this. The third basic necessity is completely free for us, and yet we have no value for it. Air is perhaps the most basic necessity of life. In fact, the first thing that you do when you're born is to take your first breath. And the last thing you do before you die is to give your last breath. Life is a period between these two breaths. Isn't it fascinating? that even life is equated to breathing. Breathing is, is essential. Uh, if you don't breathe for, the, for more than 30 seconds or one minute or two minutes, you die. That is how absolutely essential is breathing for us. And one of the most important ingredients of air that keeps us fit and well is this molecule called oxygen. On a daily basis, each one of us needs to consume 10,000 liters of air. Isn't that amazing? Despite the fact that we need to consume so much of air, yet we have absolutely no value for this very, very important basic necessity of life. The amount of oxygen that we need to consume every day is around 1,000 liters. And uh, this 1,000 liters is obtained from the 10,000 liters of air that we breathe every day. Obviously, oxygen is life. And uh, it's just not uh, necessary to generate energy, but various components of the human system, including water, is made up of oxygen. All carbohydrates have to have, a have, have to have an oxygen molecule in that. All proteins have to have an oxygen molecule, and so do all fats. Oxygen is an essential component of these basic ingredients of life, water, carbohydrates, proteins, and fats. In fact, if you look at the quantum of oxygen that is present in your body, and compare that with the other elements that are present, you'll be surprised to know that your body is made up of 65% oxygen. Isn't that amazing? Obviously, a large part of that comes from the water that is there in the body. Uh, you know, it's about 60 to 70% of the human body is just made up of water. And water comprises of oxygen and hydrogen. Hydrogen is very, very light. So obviously, the weight is because of oxygen. But other than water, all the proteins, carbohydrates, and fats uh, also contain oxygen. So it's a very, very important uh, element that uh, is responsible for giving us life. I was very inquisitive uh, when a small girl asked me this one day, Uncle, what does a car run on? And the obvious answer to that is it runs on petrol or it runs on diesel. As simple as that. I don't think it's as simple as that. In addition to that, it also requires oxygen to burn. You cannot burn petrol or diesel in the absence of oxygen. And if you do not have oxygen, obviously the engine is not going to work and the car is not going to move around. I was very inquisitive to find out what is the amount of oxygen that is required by the car to burn one liter of petrol so that it can move from point A to point B. 
And I thought uh, somebody would have thought about this question and obviously somebody would have answered this uh, in Google. So I went to Google and just typed in the question, what is the amount of oxygen consumed by a motor car uh, when, it runs, when it burns one liter of petrol? And uh, believe me, I couldn't find the answer in the first 10 pages of Google. And I was so frustrated. I said, how come nobody ever asked this question? So I had to go back to the mechanical engineering books and uh, try to understand how much oxygen is required to burn one liter of petrol. And you know what the answer I found was? 1,700 liters of oxygen is required to burn one liter of petrol. We believe that the car only runs on petrol because we pay money for the petrol. However, the car also needs a lot of oxygen, 1,700 liters. And because we do not have uh, to pay any money for it, we have no value for that. Uh, the 1,700 liters of oxygen is present in 8,500 liters of air. And the reason for that is very simple. The air contains 20% oxygen. So five times more is the amount of air that should be included in the 1,700 liters of uh, oxygen. Uh, if, I, uh, if I said I'm going to charge you for an oxygen, and uh, I, went to the, I went to the Amazon website and looked for the cost of oxygen per liter. It is available for anybody to buy. It costs 30 rupees a liter. And I said, okay, I'm not going to go give you any oxygen for free. You will have to buy oxygen to run that car. You know how much money you would need to spend on oxygen to run that car? 50,000 rupees. One liter of petrol costs 80 rupees. To burn that, you would need oxygen worth 50,000 rupees. Isn't that amazing? Because we have no value for the oxygen that is freely available for us in the air, uh, you know, we take it for granted. Despite the fact that it is perhaps the most important element that generates the energy, not only in the car, but also in the human body. In fact, 90% of the nutritional energy in the human body comes from the oxygen that we breathe. Only 10% of the energy comes from the food that we eat and the water that we drink. And I thought this is such an amazing statement, which I myself being a pulmonologist was not even aware of. 90% of the energy that the human body generates comes from the oxygen that we breathe. A second MBBS uh, student asked me this question when I was delivering this talk in a medical school. What is so special about oxygen that it generates 90% of the body's energy? That led me thinking, what does oxygen do inside the cell? Does it uh, burn? Does it create a fire? Does it heat? What does it do so that it generates 90% of the body's energy? Oh, and to be honest, it took me some while to find an answer for that. And you know where that answer was? Seven standard chemistry. The outer ring of the oxygen molecule should have eight electrons. However, it has only six electrons. And oxygen is a molecule that is deficient with two electrons, which means that oxygen is a molecule that can accept electrons. It is the simple fact of accepting electrons that is responsible for generating energy. Do you know where the accepting of electrons happens in the human cell? It happens in the mitochondria, so called as a powerhouse of the cell. And you must have heard about this word called electron transport chain. So all the food that we eat, whether it's carbohydrates or fats, the carbon molecules are broken, a lot of electrons are released, and up and until the electrons are mopped up by somebody, the energy that is present in that cannot be released. So oxygen acts as the final acceptor of the electrons and then releases all that energy in the form of ATP. If you are 70 kilos in weight, do you know that your body produces 70 kilograms of ATP every single day? Obviously it is used almost instantaneously, but uh, that is the amount or the quantum of energy that the human body generates and 90% of that is because of the oxygen that we breathe. Isn't that amazing? Just to give you an example of how this works. So if you burn one molecule of glucose in the absence of oxygen, which is called as anaerobic glycolysis, it produces two molecules of ATP. But if you burn the same molecule of glucose in the presence of oxygen, it generates 36 molecules of ATP, 18 times more. 
that's the amplifying power of oxygen that's how it works free fatty acids can be burned only in the presence of oxygen and in fact one molecule of free fatty acid such as palmitic acid ends up generating 132 molecules of atp it consumes a lot of oxygen though so oxygen is necessary it amplifies the energy production by these different nutrients so there are 8 billion people living on this planet many more animals and insects a lot more uh, motor vehicles all of them consume oxygen so at some point of time will the planet earth be depleted of oxygen or there's somebody who helps generate oxygen for us all the time do you know who produces oxygen for planet earth i'm sure all of you would say it's the plants the trees produce oxygen yes it's true but they contribute to only 30% of the earth's oxygen do you know where the 70% comes from it comes from the water bodies the green algae and the cyanobacteria that are present in the oceans and the seas and the lakes they are the ones that release 70% of the earth's oxygen and it's important for us to know that because you know the seas and the oceans are so important for us not only are they important for the water cycle but they also release a lot of oxygen that is necessary for human and obviously other forms of life as well so 70% of the oxygen is generated from the water bodies do you know which plants produce the most amount of oxygen yeah i'm sure some of you all will say it's a people tree or the uh, i don't know what other trees would say you want to know the answer the sugarcane the sugarcane plant is the one that generates the most amount of oxygen it's because it's the most efficient photosynthesizing plant that we know of it does consume a lot of sunlight a lot of carbon dioxide and a lot of water but in return it releases a lot of oxygen and it produces a lot of sugar so so that's the you know that's the beauty of this plant if you want to breathe more oxygen go and stay in a sugarcane farm or a maize farm or any place where there's a lot of grass these are the sources of plants or trees uh, that generate a lot of oxygen on a daily basis if uh, you sleep for 24 hours you don't do any work at all your body would still need to consume 500 liters of oxygen uh if you do your routine day to day activities like what you're doing today uh, your body needs to burn 1000 liters of oxygen and uh, if you're an athlete and spend a lot of time in the gym not a lot of time in exercising your body would need to burn 1500 liters of oxygen this is pure oxygen i'm not talking about air and in order to extract this oxygen present in the uh, in the air nature has given us this uh, gifted us this beautiful organ called as the lung the main function of the lung is to nourish the human body with oxygen is to soak in the oxygen that is present and deliver it to the circulatory system so we breathe 10000 liters of air every day out of which the lungs uh, extract 1000 liters the capacity is uh, about 1500 liters but isn't that amazing i mean the 10000 liters of air would actually contain 2100 liters of oxygen and out of the 2100 liters of oxygen that we breathe the lung takes in about half of it easily and it has the potential to do that to up to 1 1500 liters in 24 hours the oxygen is transported to different parts of the body in uh, this little tiny cell called as a red blood cell it is packed with what we call as hemoglobin the hemoglobin contains iron and the iron is the one that uh, attracts oxygen molecule you would be surprised to know that one red blood cell has 300 million hemoglobin molecules and that is the amount of hemoglobin molecules that are required to transport oxygen uh, to the different parts of the body uh, 300 million hemoglobin molecules is a big amount isn't it you know what the red blood cell has done it has even got rid of the nucleus it is an enucleated cell it has thrown away the nucleus do you know why it has thrown away the nucleus so that it can pack in more hemoglobin molecules so that it can take more oxygen inside the red blood cell and that's the beauty of this very tiny cell called as a red blood cell it soaks in the oxygen from the pulmonary uh, alveoli and then delivers it to all the tissues in the body now let me share with you some very stunning figures if you count every single cell in the body from the tip of your hair to the tip of your toe and and just quantify that 
the human body is made up of 37 trillion cells with a T. Out of these 37 trillion cells, 25 trillion are the red blood cells. Isn't that amazing? 65% of all the cells in your body are only red blood cells who are transporting oxygen from the lungs to the other parts of the body. Look at the amount of investment that the human body has made in order to soak in the oxygen and to transport it to all the other tissues. Why? Because it generates 90% of the body's energy. The red blood cells are produced in the bone marrow and you'll be surprised to know that 2 million red blood cells are produced every second. One second. 2 million red blood cells are destroyed every second. This is the beauty of the human body. All geared towards getting in the oxygen that is present in the air and transporting it to all the tissues of the body. So breath is life. Breath is power. Breath is beautiful. It not only gives us life, it gives us a healthy life. Uh, the ancient Rushis and Munis, they understood the beauty and the power of breath. Many of them through sheer meditation have written books on the beauty and the power of breath and uh, different forms of breathing exercises uh, are what they believe are essential for a healthy life. In fact, you can heal yourself, you can heal yourself with various kinds of diseases just by good breathing exercises. So we know pranayam is a very important, uh, uh, you know, part of the yoga practice and there's so much of science behind it. Sadly, we know so very little about the mechanisms of how the breathing exercises actually help our body. There is so much of hidden wealth in the ancient wisdom of the pranayama exercises and we need to start uh, you know, finding out the secrets of all this. So this is the beauty and the power of breath and I hope you have understood why we breathe and how important it is for our life. If I ask you what is pure air, I'm sure many of you all would hesitate because many of us don't even know what pure air actually means. Pure air is a combination of 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen, 0.93% argon, a very small proportion of carbon dioxide and water, water vapor. This is pure air. Ideally, this is what we should breathe to keep ourselves fit and well. However, because of growing urbanization, industrialization, the desire to become rich and wealthy, we have polluted the environment in which we live. And as a result, we have produced a lot of different types of air pollutants that are now causing damage to the human body. According to the uh, 2017 report by the Lancet, uh, air pollution kills six and a half million people every year three times more than people who die because of HIV, AIDS, TB, malaria, all put together. Yet, we have no importance for this environmental topic. Uh, the country that has the highest amount of air pollution in the world, yes, we should be very proud of that, isn't it? India, then comes China, then comes Pakistan, and then all the other countries. So, should we be proud that India is the most polluted country in the world? I don't think so. We should do something about it. Uh, this is a 2018 report that tells us that uh, India is the most polluted country in the world. In fact, 14 out of the world's 15 most polluted cities are in India. Did you know this? Shouldn't we be ashamed of ourselves? This is a heat map of uh, air pollution levels in different parts of India. Uh, this is through a satellite imaging and uh, you can see that the most polluted parts of India are the northern states and that includes uh, Chandigarh, Delhi, Bihar, Uttar Pradesh, Rajasthan and so on. Those are the parts of India that are really polluted. You have to look for green areas in this map because the green areas depict uh, areas that have clean air. And I think uh, this, can be some, this can be some sort of a game that you can play. Find the green color. <laughs> it's a challenge to do that, isn't it? There are only few places in India where we have relatively clean air as defined by the World Health Organization. And I think it's important for us to appreciate this. There are two types of air pollution. Uh, the first one is called AAP and this is not Aam Admi Party. This is ambient air pollution. Ambient air pollution is the pollution that is present outside your house. When you leave your house, whatever air you are exposed to is called ambient air. 
And uh, this is polluted from various sources. As you can see, motor vehicles, industries, road dust, building and construction, uh, burning of uh, uh, crop, uh, dried crops, burning of uh, garbage, and burning of dried leaves. These are all important sources of ambient air pollution. Different cities have different contributions from each of these. Uh, for example, this is from Pune city. We always believe that uh, the major source of air pollution in Pune city was from motor vehicles, but that's not the correct answer. The correct answer is from road dust. You know, the dust that is released when motorcycles pass on the road or vehicles pass on the road, that is the major source of air pollution in our city. Different cities have different sources. The other type of air pollution is called as HAP or IAP, and that represents household air pollution or indoor air pollution. So we have two types of air pollution, ambient air pollution, and let's call it indoor air pollution. Household air pollution was an earlier term that was used, but then with time we realized that it's just not the house, but your workplaces, your occupational places are also a sources of air pollution. So although that is indoor, it's not ambient. So that now comes under indoor air pollution. And the biggest source of indoor air pollution in our country is the burning of biomass fuel for cooking. In fact, 60% of the homes in India, even in 2021, they use biomass fuel for cooking. And that's the sad state of affairs because burning of wood, animal dung and crop residues generates a lot of air pollution that is known to be associated with a significant amount of harm on human health. You can see this, China, this child over here, he's breathing in highly polluted air ever since he's born. This poor mother who cooks food for the family uh, has been exposed to this for the last so many years. And uh, she has probably breathed about 35 million liters of this highly polluted air just because she's cooking food for the family. So this is an important source of indoor air pollution for our country. Now that doesn't mean that uh, uh, modern homes are uh, not generating air pollution. In fact, modern homes also generate a lot of air pollution, whether it's a bathroom or whether it's a bedroom or whether it's your know, carpeting, furniture, anything. They also are sources of important sources of indoor air pollution. Burning one mosquito coil in the night produces as much amount of smoke that is equal to smoking 100 cigarettes. This is a study that we published in CHEST a few years ago where you can see WCDC stands for window closed, door closed. WODC is window open, door closed. And WODO is window open, door open. What is the impact of keeping the door and the window open or closed on indoor levels of PM 2.5, particulate matter less than 2.5 microns? And you can see the three different types of uh, mosquito coils that we use. They show very, very high levels. When you keep the window closed and the door closed, the particulate matter pollution levels reach 2,200 micrograms per cubic meter. You know what is the safety limit prescribed by the World Health Organization? 20 micrograms per cubic meter. And what are we breathing? We're breathing 2,200 micrograms per cubic meter. Just imagine, this is more than the level of pollution that we breathe outside, even when motor, level, motor vehicles are very high. And then when you open the window, the levels come down to 350, 2,200 to 350. Huge impact, isn't it? But even 350 is very high for uh, health effects. It's only when you open the window and the door together, when the cross ventilation happens, that the levels come down to 50, 60 micrograms per cubic meter. But then the mosquitoes come in. So which is worse? The mosquito bite or the smoke from the mosquito coil? It's not an easy answer to give. Let me tell you that. A lot of people have asked me this question. Why are mosquito coils not banned? The answer to that is because we do not have good solutions to get rid of mosquitoes yet. In fact, even the other sources of, uh, even the other mosquito repellents, the uh, liquid mosquito rep uh, the repellent or the mat, they all produce high levels of indoor air pollution. So here it is. You can see the, the liquid vaporizer, the mat, and the burning of the paper. They all release a lot of air pollution. They may kill the mosquito, but in return, you, they, may, they may damage your lungs. So what is the solution? Get rid of uh, all these mosquito repellents, have mosquito nets. I use a mosquito machardani when you go to sleep. Safest and the best way to keep away from mosquito bites uh, without harming your lungs. Or then get that tennis racket. Keep on killing those mosquitoes. Safe. If 
one mosquito coil is equal to 100 cigarettes and if that shocked you, then one dhup agarbati, that small 4 centimeter one, thick 4 centimeter one, is equal to 500 cigarettes. This is the research that we did earlier at the Chess Research Foundation. Isn't that amazing? We are producing so much of indoor air pollution inside our own homes. We don't even know that. And I think that's one of the bigger problems is lack of awareness of what are the sources of air pollutants. And that's why I'm sharing this with you. So please share this information with everybody else that you know, because unless we transfer this, in, this knowledge to others, people will continue to burn mosquito coils, continue to burn dope sticks. At least dope sticks can be avoided because they serve no re really good purpose. Then you have the Agarbattis and then religious traditions. You have the Sambrani smoke in South India, the Dhanuchi smoke in West Bengal, the traditional Arti uh, smoke in various forms of religion. So I think uh, slowly we need to start uh, getting rid of burning of these incense and other things because they produce a lot of air pollution. A few years ago at the Chest Research Foundation, we measured the levels of air pollutants during the burning of different firecrackers during Diwali. How much does each firecracker produce? How much air pollution does each firecracker produce? You know which is the most harmful one? The snake tablet. One snake tablet produces 50,000 micrograms per cubic meter. Mosquito coil is 2,200. Uh, Dhup Agarbati is 10,000. This is 50,000. I mean, what are we breathing during Diwali festival? This is ridiculous. You know, burn that one small snake tablet and you have polluted the environment hugely. Then is the garland of 1,000 uh, firecrackers. And that's about 30,000 micrograms and then pull pull and sparklers and so on. We published this in Lung India a couple of years ago. Do have a look at that because it's an important study that you can use to share with your, your, your friends and colleagues about how harmful are Diwali firecrackers in terms of uh, levels of air pollution. The PURE study was a very important study done by Dr. Salim Yusuf from uh, McMaster University in Canada. And he was, he's an alumnus from St. John's Medical College in Bangalore. Uh, perhaps one of the greatest population scientists of all times. Uh, was one of the most highly respected uh, scientists in the world. So he did this study in 17 countries where he measured lung function values. Then he segregated the healthy individuals and then compared the lung function values in healthy people from across all these different continents. The stars over here represent the place where the study was conducted. And you can see that uh, India is one of the countries where the study was uh, conducted. And you can see in this graph, uh, the horizontal line as you can see here, that is the starting point. So Caucasians have the best lung function. Compared to the Caucasians, you can see the greatest decrement in lung function occurs amongst South Asians, and that is largely made up by Indian population. So India, largely made up by India. So India has the worst lung function amongst all the other parts of the world that were studied. Even worse than the Southeast Asian countries, worse than East Asia, Southeast Asia, uh, the Sub-Saharan countries, uh, even Africa and the Middle East. Indians have the smallest lungs. Compared to the Caucasians, we have lungs that are 35% smaller. These are healthy lungs, the so-called healthy Indi Indi Indians. 1977 was a time when Dr. S.R. Kamath from KM Hospital, Mumbai, uh, measured the lung function values for the first time in India. At that point of time, he had shown that we are 20% uh, weaker, or the, the lung volumes are 20% lower as compared to the Caucasians. 2014 was when the pure study was published. There's an additional 15% drop, 35% uh, drop. Uh, I mean, our lungs are 35% smaller. It cannot be because of genetic factors because genetic factors don't work in a period of 30 years. It is because of the environment in which we live. And I genuinely believe that uh, the poor quality of air that we Indians are breathing is responsible for us causing small lungs. And these small lungs are more vulnerable to the harm to, to developing more diseases. The exposure to air pollution starts even before you are born. This is a study from New York. 10 randomly selected newborn babies uh, were taken and then the umbilical cord was cut. 
a syringe was inserted, inserted inside the umbilical cord and umbilical cord blood was removed 20 ml and this uh, this blood was then sent to the laboratory to look for presence of circulating air pollutants and do you know what they found they found presence of 287 different pollutants circulating in the umbilical cord blood what does this mean that the pollutants that the mother inhales enters into the fetal circulation there is no barrier that is offered by the placenta we, we, we you know we believe that the placenta is a very powerful barrier that protects the growing fetus from a large number of toxic chemicals in terms of particulate matter pollution or other pollutants it doesn't do that at all it, it freely allows the passage of these pollutants and therefore uh, the exposure to air pollution starts even before you're born the air that your mother breathes is decides that and most of these pollutants actually came from indoor sources very nice study from japan pregnant ladies about to deliver uh, they measured the levels of air pollution and then they segregated them into those who lived within 50 meters from the main road versus those who lived more than 200 meters from the main road so if your house is next to the main road and if your house is further away from the main road what impact does it have on the babies that are born in terms of asthma risk and other allergies risk and you can see for yourself uh, babies born to mothers who lived less than 50 meters from the highway had a fourfold greater risk of having asthma as compared to babies who were born further away from the main road and the risk of uh, even eczema was two and 2.3 times more so clearly the place where you live decides the uh, risk of you developing asthma and allergies remember that children are more vulnerable to the harmful effects of air pollution obviously because the lungs are growing uh, they you know they actually breathe a lot more air pollutants than what adults do for two reasons the height is small so pollution the levels that are at the bottom they breathe more and they breathe more uh, than than adults the respiratory rate is a lot more than an adult and therefore the quantum of pollutants that they breathe is a lot more than what adults do and therefore this becomes a very vulnerable age uh, to cause harmful effects of air pollution and in fact uh, you know you can see the image of the healthy pink lungs and domestic black lungs and this is an image that was clicked by a friend of mine uh, dr arvind kumar from delhi and uh, you know young people whom he's operating for lung cancer 25 30 year old people for lung cancer he sees black lungs they've never smoked in their life but this is what they breathe and therefore you can only imagine what impact it must be having the red line over here represents the growth of lungs in india for example when you're exposed to high levels of air pollution and the green line is the children who are born in the caucasian uh, population like united states or europe for that matter so we all we, we have small lungs we don't reach the peak as what adults do in the western world leaded petrol has always been a cause of concern uh, unleaded petrol has been a cause of concern and so unleaded petrol has now been replaced with leaded petrol no leaded petrol is now replaced with unleaded petrol because we knew that it had impact on intelligence but there is now some new studies to suggest that even the unleaded petrol, the particulate matter that comes out of that has an impact on cognition, especially in the children and in the elderly. So the BMJ paper in 2018. So, so even the unleaded, the clean so-called petrol is also harmful. Very nice study from China, 25,000. How many of you all are not good in mathematics? Don't blame yourself for that. Because this study actually showed that if you're exposed to high levels of air pollution, your mathematics power goes down or even your verbal reasoning also goes down. So, it, so it's, it's nothing, it's not your fault. It's the pollution that you're breathing that is responsible for giving you less intelligence and making you weaker in mathematics. That is the impact of air pollution even on the brain. And in fact, this is one of the first studies that highlighted this, that it's not only the lungs and the other the other organs but even the brain is also affected burgers chips very nice study published a couple of years ago regional and traffic related air pollutants are associated with higher consumption of fast food and trans fat among adolescents why do these young kids like to eat at burger king or mcdonald's you know why it's because of the pollution that they breathe the nitrogen dioxide levels when they are high they stimulate the brain to make them crave 
for these uh, so-called fast foods. It's not their mistake. It's the pollution that they're breathing. Um, and, you know, Pune is one of the cities that has the highest levels of uh, nitrogen dioxide. So are there more fast food stalls in India? I believe so. Perhaps maybe that is the reason. Did you know that air pollution makes you obese or fat? So air pollution is not only associated with other impacts, but uh, it affects your your body mass index as well. You are fat not only because of you eating wrong types of food, not exercising, but you're fat because of you breathing polluted air. And there's a, there's a, there's a growing literature suggesting that this is a very, very strong component that is responsible for increasing obesity in the industrialized world. It's not only the food that you're eating, it's the pollution that you're breathing that is making you fat. So these particulate matter pollutants or some of these pollutants, uh, they are called as obesogens. They mess up the endocrine system and can and, and therefore make you uh, deposit a lot of fat. The odds of having a heart attack in a 60-year-old person uh, look at the risk factors, smoking, physical activity, so physical activities, lack of physical activity, diabetes, anger, high cholesterol, spending one hour in the traffic is a greater risk for having a heart attack than your high blood cholesterol levels is a, study, is a, is a message that came from the study. How important is this for us? So the health effects of air pollution not only affects the growing fetus, affects the lungs, affects the heart affects the vascular system, the endocrine system, and the brain. Air pollution affects almost every organ of the body. And it's important for us as doctors to be aware about that. The next part of the last part of my presentation is what can be done to reduce the levels and exposure to air pollution. The first thing is to get rid of this so-called your, your attitude. So I did not know that air pollution was bad. Oh, it's not me. It's somebody else who's producing it. Sorry, I can't do anything about it. I need a mosquito coil at night. Others will be bitten by mosquitoes. Well, let's wait and hope somebody will bring about a change and air pollution levels will come down. This mindset is called as a victim behavior mindset. And that should be completely thrown out of your brain. What you need, you need is an accountability behavior. What does that mean? Acknowledge that fact that air pollution is responsible for producing ill health. Own it. Be responsible. Yes, I have I have been a part of producing that. Uh, find solutions and make it happen. I think that accountability ladder or the mindset is a, is a very, very important thing that needs to change. Firefighting measures, uh, in uh, this is in Thailand, uh, where you have these drones that spray water so, so that the pollution levels can come down. Uh, desperate measures to reduce the levels of ambient air pollution. And then you have these protective devices like the girls wearing dupattas, doesn't work at all. And it doesn't protect you from air pollution at all. Uh, the, the mask, the surgical mask actually does. So the cotton mask that is made up of two to three layers uh, is the one that can be used and should be used to protect yourself from ambient air pollution exposure. The same mask that you're wearing for the COVID pandemic, it also works for air pollution. And in fact, all these masks that are here, which are, you know, in the market for uh, COVID pandemic, they're all very good for air pollution as well. So I think there'll, there'll have to be a behavioral change in us uh, in, a, in a completely new way so that, uh, you know, all of us start wearing masks to get rid of uh, exposure to air pollution. Anything else? Uh, smog eating cement. Uh, Italian company, they came up with, uh, you know, building these walls made up of uh, bricks that actually absorb these air pollutants. Very interesting concept. Best inventions of the year, uh, they were selected for in Time Magazine 2008. We have to come up with innovative ideas to get rid of these pollutants. We know that they are not very easy to get rid of, so at least find solutions. So uh, having your house made up of bricks that will absorb air pollution would be a solution. Can roads be a solution to, a, to pollution? And somebody from uh, LSU says, yes, air purifying asphalt and concrete. Uh, they actually absorb, soak in the air pollution and uh, reduce the level. So this is from the Netherlands. This is a building in uh, Italy and Mexico. 
the whole building is made up of is painted with titanium dioxide which absorbs nitrogen dioxide as an air pollutant and then you have the indoor air purifiers uh, are they really effective to a certain extent yes i mean in this big this slide which is a little busy uh, indoor air purifiers do reduce the levels of indoor air uh, pollutants to a certain extent uh, from 600 they can bring it down to 200 but even 200 is not good enough you need levels of below 50 and sometimes it's not possible to achieve that in highly pollu uh, polluted cities what can what else can you do road dust is a big problem and especially in a city like pune how can you get rid of road dust and you need to find innovative ways of doing that what about uh, uh, cars and motorcycles that run on electricity good solution because they do not produce any smoke but uh, that could be compensated by other places where energy is generated in the form of electricity where pollution levels may be high over there but nonetheless, at least in cities and towns, if you have electric vehicles, that could be a potential solution. Isn't this a very nice slide? The lungs take in oxygen and give out carbon dioxide, and the plants take in carbon dioxide and give out oxygen. Perfectly made for each other, isn't it? Not only that, but plants are excellent at mopping up air pollutants. They're very good at that. In fact, this is a report from uh, NASA, 1996, a book that was published by one of the authors, How to Grow Fresh Air. And uh, based on the research that they did, the next slide actually shows you the different types of plants uh, that have a very high score in terms of reducing indoor air pollution. How many of you all have these plants inside your house? I would recommend you to have these plants because uh, these are rated as very good plants to absorb air pollutants inside your house. So you have the bamboo palm, the rubber plant, the Boston fern, and the spider plant. Each one of them have different abilities in mopping up different types of air pollutants. This is the realization that keeping these plants in the office space is useful because they not only look nice, but they also absorb air pollutants. They absorb sound as well. So it's nice. It's a good idea to keep indoor plants uh, in the office as well. Um, the mother-in-law's tongue, the spider plant, and the money plant are perhaps the ones that have shown the highest amount of efficacy in reducing the levels of indoor air pollution. A few other plants that uh, have been shown to remove benzene efficiently, and then you have uh, the cactus. A lot of these cactus species, uh, they're very good at mopping up air pollutants. The money plant is particularly very good at mopping volatile organic compounds. And then you have the vertical gardens, some some buildings have vertical gardens, they actually act as you know, filtering off pollution uh, that enters inside the, uh, the societies. And so it's good, perhaps a good idea to think of a vertical garden to purify the air. And then this is Dr. G. C. R. Babu from Delhi, who talks about the five big trees that have the potential to reduce uh, air pollution levels significantly. The people tree, the Saptaparni, the Jamun, Diyodhar and the Champa are the five trees that he recommends that we should plant uh, in every place because they're very good at mopping up air pollutants. And these are my favorite ones. You know, the, the one in the middle is the Gulmor tree, very good at mopping up air pollutants. And then you have the neem tree, the rubber tree, the sweet tamarind and so on. So, I mean, all these indigenous uh, species of trees that we have, very good at, at, at uh, mopping up air pollutants and we should plant more of these and take care of these trees. In fact, you can even plant big uh, forests, small forests uh, that uh, that may be useful for for reducing the uh, air pollution. What about foods? Foods rich in omega-3 fatty acids, such as the photograph that I've shown here, have been shown to have a beneficial effect on countering the harmful effects of air pollution. So perhaps a nutrition a diet that comprises of these should be included in everyday food so that uh, you can help protect your body from the harmful effects of air pollutants. And finally, uh, eat at least uh, two different types of fruits every day. Uh, they contain antioxidants. Perhaps the simplest way to uh, build up your own inner defense uh, to, you know, to protect yourself from the harmful effects of air pollutants. Uh, I'm going to stop over here. This is a old picture of uh, me and so my son is was very old at that time. He's watching how the petrol is being filled. But what surprised me was this Boston fern, not this Boston fern, the areca palm tree, so just placed next to the petrol filling station. Brilliant idea.
because the areca palm absorbs a lot of these benzene and other pollutants uh, that are released uh, while petrol filling. So think of innovative ideas, new ideas, uh, educate and create awareness about air pollutants uh, to all your friends and colleagues and help protect your body by consuming uh, fruits and some of these omega-3 fatty acids which have been shown uh, to be very helpful in protecting yourself from the harmful effects of air pollution. Uh, thank you very much and uh, I hope you found this presentation useful and something that you can use in a clinical practice to improve uh, the quality of care that you can offer to your patients. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.